Welcome to Vietnam, where the forests are green, but the berets are always greener. And I suppose something about napalm in the morning or whatever. Anyway, you are a pilot in an army aviation company. You fly reconnaissance missions near the DMZ in this beauty. Listen, not everyone gets to fly something recognizable, okay? There are a lot of important jobs other than fighter pilot. Besides, it isn't so bad. Yeah. Well, regardless, you are about to make history in that thing. So strap in. This will be a doozy. For you aren't just any army pilot flying a fixed wing aircraft in Vietnam. You are about to become the only army pilot of a fixed wing aircraft to score an air to air kill in Vietnam. You fly out from your airbase on what will most likely be yet another recon mission near Laos. After arriving at your destination, you begin your mission, allowing your co pilot to observe the enemy down below. Suddenly, you're hit. By what? You are unsure, but you don't have the time to dwell on it. You turn hard to the right, looking down below to see if one of those damn AAA guns got a beat on you. Yet, you see nothing. Then, a whoosh and a bright orange glow flies past you. You think, maybe it's a Sam. But that can't be. It didn't come from the ground. Your heart sinks as the realization comes to you. It isn't something on the ground you are facing. It is something in the air. It is an enemy MIG, and it's tasted blood. You notice that the MIG in front of you has begun to pull out of its dive and is now turning around to finish you off. You level out, and before you get another second to come up with a quick plan to keep you alive, luck rears its head. The MIG is racing to the center of your sights. In less than an instant, the little dot on your pipper covers the MIG's burning engine. You don't think, just squeeze the trigger. You watch as tracers and unguided rockets zip through the sky and stop at the MIG. The MIG lights up like a Christmas tree and dips toward the valley. The dogfight is over in less than a minute. You have just shot down a MIG in what can only be described as a very expensive goldfish with wicked vision. You return to base. Hushed by your superiors due to crummy politics, but observed as a silent hero by fellow airmen. Or perhaps, you might just be a really good storyteller. I am the Flying Historian. I specialize in Cold War international relations and warfare, and have quite an interest in aviation history. Today, however, we will be exploring the fascinating story of that one time an OV-1 Mohawk shot down a MiG-17. Maybe. Oh yeah, you thought this whole thing was over. No, 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 no. Everyone sit back down. See, by law, every historian must have either a whiteboard or PowerPoint and must explain every important facet of a topic, even for something as small and simple as this. We get our degrees taken away if we don't. It's true. Just ask your local extremely well-qualified Starbucks barista the next time you ask for your pumpkin frap. Or just Google it. I don't know. I can't research everything for you all. Anyway, we will start here. 1947, eight years prior to the start of the Vietnam War as we all know it, and fresh off the heels of the end of World War II and the beginning of a much colder war. Yes, colder than that. Congress passes the National Security Act of 1947 and slams it on President Truman's desk, who's all too eager to sign it into law. The National Security Act of 1947 made several changes to U.S. foreign policy services and national defense services. For example, the act officially created a National Security Council in the executive branch who would assist the president, to varying degrees depending on administration, in foreign affairs decisions. The act created the Central Intelligence Agency, or the CIA, out of the Office of Strategic Services, or the OSS. The Defense Intelligence Agency would become the military's primary intelligence agency. The Department of War and the Department of the Navy would be unified under the now larger Department of Defense. The United States Army Air Force would evolve into its own branch, the United States Air Force. The new Chiefs of Staff would be added to the Joint Chiefs where applicable. 
a big change to the structure of the military indeed. Couple that with the fact that World War II had just ended, and the military was already sort of working out how the branches were going to be fighting the next big war alongside each other, and you have the perfect recipe for a nice stew. And chaos. With every general now teetering on the edge of a cliff, President Truman thought it best to give them a good shove by writing an executive order vaguely telling everyone what their jobs were, literally the very next day. And as we all know, having someone tell you what your job is while you are actively doing it is everyone's favorite thing. Executive Order 9877 really freaked out the branches. <sighs> why, why do you guys even invite me? I don't, I don't know why I come anymore. It was a vague document written by the president and presumably his staff, establishing the primary missions and functions of each branch. The ambiguity of the parameters, mixed with the already confused and agitated state each branch was in regarding what their roles were now that the big war was over, was at the tipping point. Essentially, the military devolved into a bunch of grade schoolers ripping toys out of each other's hands. Marines were afraid the army would get old ground operations outside of hell beaches. The army thought the marines were gonna get to have all the fun. The air force thought the navy were gonna be the only ones allowed to fly over water. And the navy was afraid their planes were gonna be taken away from them, etc, etc. President Truman ordered his Secretary of Defense General James V. Forrestal to fix it. From March 11th to the 14th, 1948, General Forrestal took all the Joint Chiefs to Disney World, woo! They had just been working so hard and... Oh, wait. Wait, never mind. No, he took them to Key West. There, the Chiefs, no, not them, agreed to more specified roles which each branch would fill. This settled the nerves a bit, or at least enough that not everyone was crying at Ryan's birthday anymore. Other funny issues, such as the revolt of the admirals, would happen later, but this is all we need to know for this video. The functions of the armed forces and the Joint Chiefs of Staff paper was the result of the trip and would later be known as the Key West Agreement. Five months later, after traveling to Newport, Rhode Island, a final version of the paper was made, which just rounded off some of the edges. The Key West Agreement was implemented by April 21st, 1948, and would replace President Truman's Executive Order 9877. Okay, so what's in this important paper which you are talking so much about, I hear the voices say. In Section 4, Paragraph A1, it lays out the primary missions of the U.S. Army, this includes defeating enemy land forces and to seize, occupy, and defend land forces. In paragraphs 3 and 8, the army is told that, in coordination with the other services, they must develop tactics or doctrines, equip themselves, and train for missions otherwise offered to other branches. Section 6, paragraph A1 describes the primary roles of the U.S. Air Force as to gain and maintain general air supremacy, to defeat enemy air forces, to control vital air areas, and to establish local air superiority except as otherwise assigned herein. Paragraph 3 flat out states that the U.S. Air Force is in charge of strategic air warfare, and in paragraph 4, the Air Force is asked to do the same as all the other branches to work together with other branches to create joint plans for specific circumstances and operations. All of this is to say that the branches had a little more structure and that they were told to work together when formulating doctrines for the next war. The only other important takeaway for our purposes today is section 6, paragraphs 1a and 3. Keep these in mind as the Air Force made certain that the Army never forgot. The OV-1 Mohawk is a special creature. It sort of reminds me of this Amazonian bird. And he's kind of cute, I suppose. The Mohawk was the love child of the U.S. Army and Marine Corps. Infighting between the branches on military projects is required, especially when it comes to the Navy being involved in anything. 
Even before the OV-1s made in flight, the Marine Corps had already pulled out of the project. The Grumman Mohawk is expected to increase the Army's capability for round-the-clock battlefield surveillance and target acquisition by electronic, visual, and photographic means. Initially designed for aerial reconnaissance, the Army began to see the OV-1 as a perfect addition to their fledgling air mobile strategy. The idea of using a mix of helicopters and small fixed-wing aircraft to rapidly deploy military forces to an area and support them from the air through aerial surveillance and CAS, or close air support. The Army began testing different weapon systems on the Mohawks to see, very basically at first, if the Mohawk could even effectively carry and use the weapons. They tried everything. Machine gun pods, unguided rocket pods, guided missiles, grenade launchers, hell, even air-to-air -air missiles. Anything the Army could get their hands on. Inevitably, the U.S. Air Force caught wind of what was happening and became their main roadblock, stopping the Army from testing these weapons on Mohawks. The idea that the Army had a fixed-wing aircraft with the potential of conducting light ground attack was a threat to the missions the Air Force kept so close to their hearts. To combat this, the U.S. Army redesignated the OV-1As and Cs being used for testing to JOV-1. This set them as temporary experiments instead of formal variants. The Army was also doing this with other aircraft they weren't necessarily meant to have, but that's a separate story. Let's get back to Vietnam. By 1963, the 23rd Special Warfare Aviation Detachment, operating in South Vietnam, had received six JOV-1As. The U.S. Air Force allowed these aircraft only to carry two XM-14 gun pods, and only for self-defense. Pictures show that these aircraft would continue to carry a variety of different munitions in defiance of the Air Force's wishes. The Mohawks were great at their job of recon, but reports suggested that they were being held back. According to research done by the Army Concept Team in Vietnam, while reporting on Mohawk usage by the 23rd Special Warfare Aviation Detachment from December 16, 1962 through January 15, 1963, they found that U.S. advisors and Arvin commanders believed the OV-1 to be an effective light ground attack aircraft if restrictions on its use for such a purpose could be loosened. The Air Force, of course, did not loosen their restrictions, but it wouldn't really matter. By 1964, the 23rd was merged with other units, forming the 73rd Aviation Company, or Aerial Surveillance. Remaining JOV-1s would be dispersed to other units. Evidence shows that even this rearrangement did not stop Army Mohawks from being armed. This would further fly in the face of other agreements made between the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Army. The Johnson-McConnell Agreement of 1966 was a U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force agreement made between the respective Joint Chiefs. Army Chief General Harold K. Johnson and Air Force Chief General John P. McConnell. The agreement was formally signed on April 6, 1966 and announced April 15, 1966. Very simply, the agreement was that the Army would relinquish its fixed-wing cargo aircraft to the U.S. Air Force in exchange for operating and arming rotary-wing aircraft for ground support. This agreement was in part to allow the Army to have some ground support role so that they would stop trying to have fixed-wing ground support, a role which the U.S. Air Force had claimed many years prior. All of this finally leads us back to where we began a story with many twists and turns. Army aviator Ken Lee would first learn how to fly the OV-1 in early 1964, leaving for his first tour in Vietnam in September the same year. His first tour would end in November 1965. The 27-year-old Captain Lee would return to Vietnam in 1967 flying several recon missions over Laos and North Vietnam. He would be wounded during an operation and was forced to take time off from flying. Quote, I was wounded the 1st of October, 1967, at the border between South Vietnam and Laos. A 51 caliber round came through the side skin of the aircraft and went through my flat shaft, damaged my 45 caliber sidearm, through my survival radio and survival kit. I was next in the bullet's path. 
I was not able to fly again for three weeks. On his second mission after returning to duty in early 1968, Lee would encounter a life-changing event. While Lee and a second Mohawk flew over what is now Ah Shao Valley, his flight was attacked by a MiG-17. The MiG scored several hits on Lee's Mohawk. Quote, when I felt the bullets on the aircraft, I told my wingman to break south, as there was no point in both of us getting shot down. I was still a bit jumpy in the area. I didn't want another 51 caliber round in my side. So I started a right turn to put some distance between me and the AAA batteries in the valley. I looked out the right side of the airplane to clear my turn. And then, just as I began the turn, the MiG flew past me. I had only 170 knots of airspeed very heavy. Lee's observer slash co-pilot threw up in his helmet bag, ruining a new camera and oxygen mask following the sharp turn and MiG passing. When the MiG passed, without missing a beat, Lee fired his XM-14 50 caliber gun pods and two M-159 unguided rockets from their pods. When he passed me, he just about lined himself up. He just happened to be right on my pipper. So I have to say, there was no great skill involved in meeting him or anything. I just started shooting. The MiG had made a fatal error in overshooting the slower prop-driven plane. The MiG caught fire and went down into the valley. Lee did not see the MiG hit the ground, but reported that the weather that day, combined with the MiG's condition, would almost guarantee a successful kill. After landing and inspecting his plane, Lee found it full of 23 millimeter holes. Lee was told to keep quiet about the encounter. The Army was reportedly concerned that if the U.S. Air Force caught wind of the incident, then they might pull the Mohawks from the Army's hands. Fighter pilot legends Robin Olds and Daniel Chappie James both congratulated the pilot for his kill. I actually knew both of them. Colonel Olds would meet me on the flight line and pick me, and only me, up and take me up to the debrief room. He would have a case of Bud ice down, and I would give him targets that I had been working on in Laos the week before. So he was not a stranger. He was a very warm and personable man. I respected him, and he knew it. I was not afraid to just sit and talk to him. The two colonels demanded a celebration for the victory. When I met him at the club the next time I went to Ubon, he and Colonel James put me in the center of a line for a MiG sweep. I was not able to find a definitive answer as to what a MiG sweep is in relation to the context given by Captain Lee, so moving on. Drinks and food on the house. The MiG sweep was a real thrill. I still think of them both. You would never know that he was a genuine hero. He did not show any weakness in his character and did not allow you to show any weakness either. He brought out your strengths in a way that made you feel you had done it yourself. He was a national hero and treated me, an army captain, as an equal. I never saw them acting like they were as beat down from flying missions as we were. He did not seem to be too taxed at the time, always relaxed and no pressure. Later, both colonels told Lee that his kill would be, and or had been, recognized by the U.S. Air Force already. Ironically, this coming from the same branch the Army wanted to keep the kill hidden from. This isn't the only time Lee has told this story, however. Another telling goes as follows. On a mid-morning in February 1968, a flight of two OV-1As from the 131st Aviation Company were flying at 2,000 feet in the Ah Shao Valley in South Vietnam. The valley held more than its fair share of AAA. Captain Lee turned hard right upon feeling his aircraft get hit, and his wingman, a half mile behind him, yelling, You got a MiG behind you! Lee would level his wings soon after the turn, and a MiG-17 rushed from above him at 275 knots to his left. The MiG pulled out of his dive, around 200 feet below Lee, and started to turn back to attack the two Mohawks. The MiG had decreased its speed, and in his turn, flew right in front of Lee's Mohawk. Lee fired 38 2.75-inch rockets and, quote, many, unquote, machine gun rounds at the MiG. Four rockets would hit their target and many 50 caliber rounds. I 
put about a hundred rounds of 50 caliber into him. I could see the tracers going into the fuselage. Hitting his engine killed his power. Since the MiG was climbing when it was hit, it entered the heavy cloud cover above them. Lee followed into the clouds. And exited to the right. The MiG reappeared three to five seconds after Lee. Lee stated that the MiG's right wing was low, the nose pitched over, and orange flames were coming from the plane. He states that the MiG then went into the valley, a flight that Lee says was very dangerous. Lee also states that at the altitude they were at, the MiG's choice would have concluded an almost certain death. Lee did not see the MiG crash. After returning to Fubai Air Base, Lee discovered many bullet holes in his tail and aft fuselage. He and his wingman were told not to talk about the encounter, as the army feared the Air Force would take their Mohawks away for doing something that was strictly out of their domain, air-to-air -air combat. A few weeks later, Lee flew to Ubon, where he met with Robin Olds. Olds had heard rumors of a Mohawk pilot shooting down a MiG. Lee told Olds that he was the one who did it. In May, one of Lee's missions brought him back to the Ubon airbase. Upon landing, Olds and James whisked him away to the officers' club, where they told him that a MiG was shot down in a fashion fitting the description given by Lee. When Lee asked how they knew, he reportedly was told by Olds we know things you guys don't, and we'll never find out. Ken Lee began flying the Mohawk in early 1964 and completed type transition training by September 1964. Lee's first tour began in November 1964, where he flew with the 23rd Special Warfare Aviation Detachment, and later with the 73rd Surveillance Aviation Company, with callsign Uptight. Lee's first tour ended in November 1965. Ken Lee started his second tour in a Mohawk in August 1967. He was assigned to the 131st Aviation Company, Nighthawks, call sign Spud, personal call sign Martini, out of the Fubai Air Base. His group flew OV-1A, B, and C Mohawks. Their missions focused on target acquisition in Laos and southern North Vietnam. Quote, I was wounded the 1st of October 1967. At the border between South Vietnam and Laos, a 51 caliber round came through the side skin of the aircraft and went through my flat jacket, damaged my 45 caliber sidearm, through my survival radio, and survival kit. I was next in a bullet's path. I was not able to fly again for three weeks, and the MiG incident came on about the second mission I flew after I began flying again. While flying, quote, just a couple of thousand feet, end quote, above the Ah Shao Valley, with heavy cloud cover above them, Lee's flight of two was attacked by a single MiG-17. When I felt the hits on the aircraft, I told my wingman to break south. As there was no point in both of us getting shot down, I was still a bit jumpy in that area. I didn't want another 51 caliber round in my side. The MiG scored hits on Lee's aircraft before overshooting. I looked out the right side of the airplane to clear my turn, and then, just as I began the turn, the MiG flew past me. At first, I thought the MiG might have been an Aussie F-86. Our AAF CA-27 Sabres were based out of Ubon in those days. But then I saw the red star on his tail. The MiG then began to turn to re-engage, but flew right in front of Lee's plane in the process. Lee used his M159 2.75 inch rocket pods and two XM-14 50 caliber gun pods. When he passed me, he just about lined himself up just happened to be right on my targeting pipper, so I have to say, there was no great skill involved in leading him or anything. I just started shooting. Lee's co-pilot threw up right before Lee took the shot. Lee shot most of his rockets, believing four hit their target. Lee also believes that around a hundred rounds from his gun pods hit the MiG, based upon the tracers which he saw. After shooting at the MiG, Lee claims that it was a blaze just before losing sight of it in a cloud bank. Lee is certain that the MiG continued down toward the valley where difficult terrain and weather that day surely would have forced the pilot to eject or crash. Upon landing, Lee noticed the 23 millimeter holes in his plane. He notified his COs that he believed to have shot down a MiG and both him and his co-pilot were told to keep quiet about it, presumably so the army could continue to operate the Mohawks. Lee had flown to Ubon Air Force Base several times prior to the incident. 
There, he would meet with Colonel Olds and give him info on targets in Laos. I actually knew both of them. Colonel Olds would meet me on the flight line and pick me, and only me, up, and take me up to the debrief room. He had a case of butt ice down, and I'd give him targets that I had been working on in Laos the week before. So he was not a stranger. He was a very warm and personable man. I respected him, and he knew it. I was not afraid to just sit and talk to him. When I met him at the club the next time I went to Uban, he and Colonel James put me in the center of a line for a nib sweep. Drinks and food at my house. The nib sweep was a real thrill. I still think of them both. He would never know that he was in Jimmy's room. He did not check in between his character. He did not rise with the second to the second. He died with the second, and I didn't feel like he had done it yet. He was a nice guy. He took me to the time stopping. He did not have a good time to Reportedly, Olds and James told Lee that his MIG kill had been confirmed while at the MIG sweep ceremony. In this interview, Lee said that he was 78 years old. He stated that many have discounted his tale as being fantastical. Quote, It has been 51 years since these things happened, and the memory of exact dates and tail numbers, serial numbers, seem to have passed with time. I do not remember the name of the right seat observer, I just remember him vomiting in his helmet bag when he saw the MiG going by. Ruined his nice new camera and oxygen mask. A fantastic story indeed, but there are certainly some things in the recounting of this event which make my historian nose twitch. Fishy odors which make me ponder. First off, it seems that we don't have any confirmation of the kill via a gun camera. Cause why would there be one? Yet, we don't know if any of the other observation tools on the aircraft managed to capture anything. The co-pilot, who reportedly vomited, maybe in fear or adrenaline, hasn't been identified, at least that I could find. The wingman and his co-pilot haven't been identified either, it doesn't seem. Maybe it was Lee's rank and connections to other high-ranking members of the services which gave him the confidence to speak up about the event. Maybe it is just because it was his glory and not the others to take, and that's why none have spoken up about it. It means, though, that his story, one which has inevitably shifted with time, is the only one we have right now. This is certainly a common issue historians face within the field, but one to always keep in mind. Second, if Lee did shoot down the MiG, he is consistent in saying that he never saw the MiG crash. 50 caliber rounds are notorious for being weaker at taking down jet targets, but 100 plus rounds seems reasonable. Maybe those rockets did substantial damage if they did hit. Some articles suggested that perhaps the MiG crashed by itself following the overshoot. Maybe Lee did fire his guns, but the fireball the MiG made was actually him crashing. I doubt this though, as Lee would have certainly known that the MiG was destroyed if that was the case. Third, following Operation Bolo, another great story in military aviation history, from January 2nd, 5th, and 6th, 1967, the Vietnamese People's Air Force, after having lost many of their aircraft during the operation, grounded much of their forces for a re-evaluation of their tactics and training. Some sources say that this lasted several months, others say about four months. This means that it is plausible that MiGs would be back in the air come Lee's case. Though, MiGs flying to intercept recon aircraft south of the DMZ seems strange. Easy targets for sure, but close to American fighters. Lee said in one interview, quote, This incident was not the only time I had been attacked from above and not below. I had 51 caliber holes in the aircraft I was flying on two other occasions. They were after the MiG incident, and there was no explanation as to how they got there, as neither did my wingman see anything, nor did I. Colonel Olds did tell me that the North Vietnamese had opened an airfield just north of the DMZ, so they could make shock runs into our operating area. End quote. Maybe there was a North Vietnamese airbase near the DMZ, and they decided to bite at the Americans. But this leads to... Fourth are the tactics used by the MiG. For the most part, MiGs, typically two, would swoop in and harass American aircraft, bombers especially, before rushing back to base so as to avoid a tango with American fighters. There are cases where MiGs turned back for a second helping of American booty though. In 1965, a group of Navy A-1 Sky Raiders on a rescue mission for a fellow downed airman were attacked by a group of MiG-17s. 
This is also another incredible story of a plane not built to take on jet fighters shooting down a MiG. Their story has some similarities to Lee's, including the fact that one of the MiGs attacking their group turned around for a second helping. Lee says in some retellings that the MiGs started to turn around to potentially re-engage with the Mohawks. With this said, it is possible that a single MiG attacked Lee's group, but we're still lacking some critical pieces of evidence that would help sweeten the deal. Fifth, the Mohawks were not supposed to be armed. Now this is an argument I saw often with those who doubted Lee's story. We have already discussed this quite a bit, so I won't dwell on it for too long. We know that Lee was a member of the groups who often flew armed Mohawks, and while researching, I did find that Mohawk pilots conducting recon would sometimes take shots at targets which they had found. This would really be the only reason why a Mohawk pilot would use their weapons. Unless they ran into a slow-flying cargo plane, would their weapons be useful in air-to-air -air combat, but they were strictly forbidden from participating in such an activity. Lee's circumstance was luck, in that the stars aligned for his weapons to be useful against a far superior enemy. I don't believe Lee is lying about being armed, however. Six, the thing that made me laugh out loud when I read it, something that just didn't feel right. What Olds reportedly said to Lee. We know things you guys don't and we'll never find out. Olds was a badass by most accounts and I wouldn't put this statement past him, but it does sound like a James Bond quote. I've spoken with many old vets, and them saying something like this in hindsight is not uncommon. Hell, a family member of mine has said, I tell ya, but I would have to kill ya. Though, I have also been on the internet long enough to know that this rhymes a little too well with... Nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up! Olds may have known, but it is strange I wasn't able to find anything regarding Olds talking about his Mohawk pilot friend. What I did find was a bunch of famous pilots of the time talking about how Robin Olds was a good friend of theirs too. Not discounting any of their relationships, but perhaps Olds, remembered fondly for his excellent leadership qualities, was just a good boss. Worked with those in and out of his department, so to speak. Treated everyone with respect listened and cherished others' ideas and opinions. All of these qualities I have read countless times when it comes to Olds. Even Lee recounts many of the same attributes we've talked about. Upon having trouble finding any account of the Air Force recognizing this amazing story, as well as the Army, in public at least, I'm sort of leaning toward Olds just being a good leader. Did he say any of the things Lee reports him saying in regards to the MiG kill? It's possible. I also think it's possible that Olds wanted to keep his fellow pilot spirits high, especially during a very difficult time in the war, 1968. Finally, the many iterations of the story are affected by time, witness testimony, plus some when it's only one witness, and that it doesn't seem like Lee wrote about the incident soon after it occurring. I think this would help solidify some of the consistent changes, however small they are, in the different tellings of the story. Did the MiG go up or down after it was struck? What combination of weapons were used? Did Lee abort a right turn, then shoot at the MiG? Or did the MiG fly in front of Lee while he was in a right turn? Did the MiG pass Lee and then he shot? Or did the MiG pass Lee and he shot the MiG while it was in a turn? And so on. Lee would finish his second tour in September 1968 and go on to live, quote, well, unquote. Lee's victory was formally recognized by the army in 2007, according to one article I found. To be perfectly clear, I only found one article that said that he was formally recognized by the army. I found another article that said he has never been recognized by either the Air Force or the army. And I scoured everywhere I could think of in order to find even an inkling of a mention of Captain Lee or a Mohawk shooting down another aircraft, or what have you. I just couldn't find anything. As Lee said in one of his last interviews on the subject, he has been questioned many times, but I want to make it clear that this video was in no way trying to discredit him. I heard about the story as a fun fact and was intrigued. I went into researching for this video with the intention of finding out more. More specifically, to see if I had been duped or not. 
What I found is something I find often when it comes to history on the internet. It's complicated. This story's authenticity, like many war stories I've analyzed over the years, relies heavily in the historian's trust of the author. We take many war stories as fact after finding a collection of accounts all speaking about the same thing and relating, relatively, the same events. This is not one of those cases, however. Even though in Western society, war stories are often regarded as just that, stories, many will take them as fact, especially if they are coming from a family member or combat veteran. Honestly, if you are to take anything from this video, I hope it is this. Be curious. Skeptical, sure, but curious. Curiosity is more likely to lead you down a path of understanding rather than one filled with bias and misinformation. I did hope that this story was true, because oh my gosh, that would have been wild. And I'm not concluding that it isn't true, but I would say that it is unsolved. Then again, my time and access to certain resources only goes so far. Maybe when I don't need to worry about paying rent, I could solve this mystery. In the meantime, this was the potentially true story of when this shot down this. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I know it's been a long time since I've released one, and don't worry, I have other videos planned that won't take as much time as this one, because this was very labor intensive, but I am working on a few other things in the background, so videos might not be coming out as often. Uh, the trailer for the channel definitely needs to be updated. I'm not releasing every Saturday or every other Saturday. That's not gonna happen. I think I made that trailer when I was unemployed and had a lot more dreams than I do now. But anyways, thank you so much again. Uh, if you are looking for any of the sources, they're all going to be down in the description, specifically the songs and the sources I used to make the video, and that's about it. So yeah, okay, bye-bye.